So our speaker, Brian Goldman, uh, is one of the rare individuals with great success in not one, but several adrenaline-pumping careers. <laughs> Goldman is, highly regarded, is a highly regarded emergency physician at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. He is also host of the Canadian Bros Broadcasting Corporation's award-winning radio show, White Coat, Black Art, where he takes listeners behind the scenes of hospitals and doctors' offices. Goldman unpacks and demystifies what goes on inside the medicines or med, inside medicines sliding doors with edgy topics that include the whistleblowing in healthcare, burning out amongst, amongst healthcare professionals, racism in healthcare, and how to get or how getting to the head of the line in healthcare. Goldman is a one uh, is on a lifelong campaign to confront medical errors and create a culture of safety for patients. He has proven unafraid of using his own medical mistakes for examples on how doctors can improve. His TED Talk, Doctors Make Mistakes, Can We Talk About That, has been watched by over one million viewers. And Dr. Goldman has uh, worked as a health reporter for the national CBC television's flagship news program for CBC TV's The Health Show and served as a senior production executive during the launch year of Discovery Health Channel, Canada's 24-hour channel devoted to healthcare programming. His, he is the author of the best-selling book, Night Shift, Real Life in the ER, which takes readers through the giddy heights and crashing lows as Goldman works through a typical night shift in one of Canada's busiest ERs. He's going to be talking today about his new book, The Power of Kindness, where Brian leaves the comfortable, familiar setting surroundings of the hospital in search of his own lost compassion. Please welcome joining Shannon and Brian. This is exciting. I'm excited too. Are you going to start with your reading? Do you want me to start with the reading? I think that'd be lovely. Does everybody know the book? This is what it looks like. The Power of Kindness. Why Empathy is Essential in Everyday Life. And I think uh, Dr. Goldman was going to read a bit of, yes. a, bit of a passage. I'll be happy to, be great. to do that. Okay. I'm going to the reading parlor. <laughs> me. Okay. The elevator opens on the third floor of the Daniel Spectrum, a hub for culture and innovation located in the heart of Toronto's Regent Park neighborhood. I turn right and walk down a long hallway to a meeting room with the door closed. A middle-aged woman approaches me. You're here to meet Sidra, the woman smiles at me. She opens the door and motions me to walk in. Twelve people are seated in a circle in the middle of the room. You're just in time, says a man in his mid-twenties, who's standing in the middle of the circle. He hands me the weirdest set of goggles I've ever seen. A Samsung Galaxy smartphone turned on its side and fitted into a frame made of heavy-duty cardboard. It's a lot cheaper than the Oculus Rift, a snazzier-looking virtual reality headset built, built for serious gamers. And it's less cumbersome. Where these goggles work with a smartphone, the Oculus Rift requires a computer. Clouds Over Sidra is the first ever film shot in virtual reality, VR, for the United Nations. It was shot at the Zaatari refugee camp in Jordan, home to as many as 120,000 Syrian refugees. Sidra, the 12-year-old girl who stars in the film, has been living at the Zaatari camp since the summer of 2013. The film uses proprietary technology developed especially for Here Be Dragons, a VR production company founded by Chris Milk, an award-winning artist and director of commercials and music videos. The conflict in Syria began in March 2011. Since the start of the Civil War, the United Nations estimates that 400,000 Syrians have been killed and 6.3 million have been displaced internally. More than 5 million have fled the country, becoming refugees like Sidra. The young man helps fit the goggles on me. My eyes adjust, and I see a computer display with a list of menu items and a blinking cursor. You'll be able to watch the film in a moment the young man addresses everyone in the room. Remember, the film is shot in 360 degrees. Try looking up and down, and don't forget to look behind you. There's something to see everywhere you look. In a TED Talk, Chris Milk, co-director of the film, called VR an empathy machine. 
the UN footed the six-figure budget to raise awareness and money for Syrian refugees. My motive in watching the film is to find out how much VR cranks empathy, if at all. The young man gives final instructions. It can be very disorienting at first, he warns. Some people get vertigo for the first few minutes. If you're prone to migraines, you might get a headache. Let me know if you experience either. I'm glad I didn't eat, says one of my co-participants. Okay, press the home key on your phone when you want to begin viewing, says the young man. We'll get back to you when the film is over. I push the button. Suddenly, I'm transported to a landscape of sand dunes and mountains. With my goggles, I can see them all around me. Then a quiet voice fills the stark and barren landscape. We walked for days crossing the desert into Jordan, says the off-screen voice of a young girl in accented English. The week we left, my kite got stuck in a tree in our yard. I wonder if it's still there. I want it back. The desert fades to black and I'm transported into a bedroom inside the Jordanian camp. A young girl is sitting on a bed facing me. My name is Sidra and I'm 12 years old, she says. For the next nine or so minutes, I experience scenes from a day in the life of Sidra. I see her at school and out in the field playing soccer with her friends. I see young men pumping iron in a gym and playing computer games. I'm surprised by the vividness of the scenes that unfold in front of me. Sidra's baby brother shrieks and appears to pass right by me. I turn around and see the toddler walk out the bedroom door. Near the end of the film, Sidra walks into a big tent where her mother has prepared dinner. The whole family is there. I still love her food, even if she doesn't have the spices she used to, she says. And suddenly, I can think of little else except fish sticks and craft dinner, the comfort foods my mother made for me when I was Sidra's age. Unlike the young refugee, my early childhood challenges included learning how to ride a bike and thrive at summer camp without crying myself to sleep from loneliness. In the final scene, there's a panoramic view of the desert and the cloudy sky. My teacher says the clouds moving over us also came here from Syria, says Sidra in a voiceover. Someday the clouds and me are going to turn around and go back home. I start to cry. I'm still crying when I hand back the goggles. Sorry about getting them wet, I tell the young man. Don't worry, he says. We're used to it. Thank you. I'm curious, out of all the things you could have picked, and there are so many that you could have picked to read, why that one? I picked that one because um, I didn't want to hit you over the head with, with me talking about me personally. There's a, you know, I, I, I was looking for something that, that, that told you about my personal journey, that I was seeking empathy, in, in, and that I was willing to seek it in strange places. And that not only was I looking at something, you know, learning about, studying, curious about something that is <clears throat> as fundamental to being human as empathy and kindness, but I also wanted to give a 21st century take on it, including virtual empathy. And there's a lot more about virtual empathy in that chapter. Also, uh, it's a five minute reading. I could have given you something that was closer to a 15 minute reading. But I thought you might want to get around to asking your questions. So those are some of the reasons why I chose it. So we're going to um, sort of interchange between questions for myself and questions from you guys. Um, there's some mics in the audience that will be passed around if you have a question. Um, we, I think I'd like to be, uh, we had this really fabulous conversation in the boardroom while we were waiting to come in. Uh, you're very easy to talk to. Um, and uh, I think we'll probably just weave and bob between questions for myself um, and questions from you guys. So if you have, um, just raise your hand. Someone in the, uh, there's people with mics that will see you and uh, we'll, we'll go back and forth. Um, I, I know that not everybody in the room will have read your book, um, so maybe could you tell us a little bit about what it's about, and I, I don't mean that as a um, simple question, uh, it's about kindness obviously, but I'd like to hear from you what it's about, and, and also if you can, why you wrote it. 
So the book um, was originally supposed to be an examination of empathy and kindness in healthcare. And, and it was a sequel. I thought of it as a companion piece to my previous book, The Secret Language of Doctors, where I came around, if you, if you're, this is a book that, ex, that talked about modern medical culture and in a less than flattering way and as symbolized by the slang or argot or argo that we use to talk about, to kind of sum up in, in a few pithy words or sometimes less than pithy words, the frustrations in healthcare, um, you know, maybe the, the the patients that we find difficult or challenging, the colleagues we find difficult or challenging, the situations we find emotionally charged. <clears throat> and um, as I was summing up the book, uh, I th like a lot of this slang is horrible, it's stereotypes of behavior without getting to know the person who has the behavior. And, and it occurred to me as I was summing up the book, and I wrote it in the final chapter, that, that all of these bits of slang, slang for people with mental health issues, slang for, for obstetrical patients who, who uh, want to have a birth plan that, that, that is to their liking in, a, in, a, in, a, in an uncertain situation, which, which, is, which is what birth is sometimes, at least. Um, patients who come to the emergency department who are anxious, um, and, 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 and all, each of these slang bits had one thing in common. They lacked empathy for the human being who, uh, who was, was there, who was experiencing that. And so after the, you know, in the fallout from the book, after, as I was thinking about the book, I wanted to do a book about, uh, the, my next book would be about a search for empathy in healthcare. And the, uh, and I, I, I made a good proposal and, uh, the publisher Harper Collins considered it. And my editor, Jim Gifford, who's a wonderful editor, came back to me and said, um, they don't want that book. They think it's too narrow, too much of a niche. And I, th I, th I think they suspected that it would be a, a, a negative expose of, of lack of empathy in healthcare, of people you know, lying, lying on a gurney in the emergency department for five days and people walking around them as if they're a piece of furniture and, and, and that sort of thing. So they, they, but, but to their credit, they said, we still want you to write a book, but get bigger. Go into the world, write about empathy wherever you find it, in a bar, in a coffee shop, in a subway, in an elevator. And, and you know, talk about customer service. You know, don't, don't just, like, in other words, leave the, the medical world. And, and it was scary, as I, Shannon, as I, was, as I was saying to you uh, in the green room, um, it took me away from my comfort zone. I was used to, at this point, the genre of creative nonfiction in healthcare. You know, and uh, uh, it reminds me of a patient I'll call John, and I disguise all the details just to get to the essence of the, of the story. That was all gone. Now suddenly I was, I was trying to do character portraits of people uh, who weren't involved in healthcare. You know, sometimes there were, there were healthcare stories, and, and, and so that was the new mission, but it had to have a frame. It had to have a framing, not just a device, but a reason for the book. I thought, um, my fear was that I was going to have a book that, that, that people would read and say, oh, there's an empathetic person in Brazil, there's an empathetic person in Australia, oh, here's another one in Japan, and the book would be pointless. So it became a search for the most, of the kindest people I could find on the planet, not, to, and you know, they may not be the kindest, but they are of a certain type. And, and so I would tell their story of kindness, their acts of kindness, much of which would be known, but more important, I would get inside their heads and try to figure out how they turned out the way they were. <clears throat> were they born that way? Did they acquire it? And if they did, what was it that happened? Was somebody kind to them and they paid it forward? Or did they suffer some misfortune or some loss or some, or some, some kind of disappointment that propelled them to be empathetic to people in the same or empathic to, the, to people in the same in the same uh, straits, and and you know it had to come back to me, my own search for kindness, and and you know I be, I I had been aware for a while that I was, uh, that I had moments of unkindness in in my world of journalism in the emergency department, and I wanted to delve into that and and really what 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 <clears throat> what what was clear to me was that. There were times when I could be kind, but there was so much stuff getting in the way of a natural inclination to kindness in the emergency department. I wanted to explore some of that because some of those themes are universal. But, but 
What really brought it into sharp focus were a couple of stories. Um, one incident in which I was unkind to the family uh, of a woman who, <clears throat> who arrived in the emergency department at the end stage of a degenerative disease, multiple sclerosis, and her family needed her to be admitted to hospital because they had reached the end of their rope. I didn't see any of that. What I saw was a large group of adult family members surrounding her, telling me what was supposed to happen, and I immediately had that irritated stance of the eMERGE physician whose, whose mind, whose opinions are irrelevant. I'm just a vehicle to getting the internist to see her and get her admitted to hospital. And, and so I saw, so there I was stereotyping her, stereotyping the family. And, and it took a long time for the, I, I did what they asked, but it took a long time for the internist to see her because she wasn't acutely ill. Uh, so they kept triaging her down, down, down uh, in favor of seeing people who were more urgently ill with pneumonia. And at one point, the daughter uh, of, of the woman who could not speak for herself, and that was another irritation uh, for, I, I think a lot of emergency physicians don't like it because they're trying to size up a patient and they want to feel like they've had contact with the patient directly in their own words. Anyway, the daughter um, asked me sarcastically if I had actually made the referral. It had taken so long she expressed some doubt, and I snapped at her, which was very unusual for me. And and um, it, you know she was she was uh, she was eventually seen, admitted, and she passed away a few months later, a few weeks later, as expected. And a few months after that, I received a long letter from the husband uh, of the woman, um, basically listing my acts of unkindness. And 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 but. You know that was one part of it. The other part was inviting me to meet with the family, so I could, so they could see if there was still a kind person lurking under all that brusqueness. And and you know, I, in 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 medicine, you know, we're often very defensive about that, about being called out for an error. And and there isn't a lot of of free speaking about about these difficult topics. You know, on on social media in the last few days on Twitter. Um, uh, I've been I've been uh, part of a long um, uh, string of of comments from families um, of kids with complex illnesses, and you know they are so familiar with the system, the way it works and the way it doesn't work, that their criticisms hit home, and they're they're constructive criticism, but they often find that when they want to give them, you know, you could do this registration thing a different way, or you could rearrange these appointments so that I don't have to bring my child back nine times. I could bring them back twice. And, and, but the system doesn't want to hear it. Doesn't want to hear those, those, those bits of criticism because it's often physicians and other healthcare providers are defensive. Anyway, so that was me. So what I'm trying to say is I was one of many. Then um, it really all kind of crystallized the mission of the book um, after a few months after my father died. And I, I, without going into detail, because I know we, we want questions from the audience, I, I knew for the first time what it was like to be that family, because at that point in time, I, my sister and I had, had been there when our parents had been, they were both had various illnesses, had been admitted to hospital 14 times, we counted once, 14 times between the two of them. And we, we, we saw the movie from the standpoint of the, of the families and the patients. And, and up until then, I, I had no understanding, no clear understanding of, of, of what it was like to be that 50-something son or daughter um, in the, in the, at the patient's bedside at 5 o'clock in the morning when they'd been up there all night and they're still waiting for the interns to see the patient. But through my father's experience, and particularly on the day he died, when the, the attending physician came in and was terrified, looked at my face and thought I was going to start hitting him because he died. His death wasn't sudden. He had advanced coronary artery disease. But I had actually gone home at 10 o'clock at night, and there I was at 2 in the morning. I'd missed his death. And, uh, and he thought I was going to hit him. He, you know, he thought I was going to start grilling him, and I wasn't because because now I knew I just I was a grieving son. A, a hug would have been nice, but you know, but I could see his discomfort with that part of it, and at the same time I could empathize with him because I'd been him, and I wanted to understand if there was some other way, and that's what propelled me to write the book. There's so much in there we could ask about. Yeah. Um, I uh, I'm. 
interested because you uh, in talking about your own understanding of kindness that came out of the book and of course you learned a lot about it from various people you spoke to but um, we we connected in the in the green room the boardroom beforehand about the uh, the need for a growth mindset um, when you set out to write the new book not the book you pitched but the book you were asked to write and that it took you out of your comfort zone and my own experience um, is that when you are made vulnerable there is actually a huge need for kindness towards yourself or from other people towards yourself. So I'm interested, where do you, did you have that experience of needing to find kindness from yourself towards yourself while you're writing this? And was that as much of a thing as the kindness you learned about or saw in the people that you interviewed? The short answer is yes, I did need to learn to be kind to myself. Although, you know, I think I, you know, I've been, as, as, I, as I wrote in one of my books, um, one of my high school uh, classmates said that Brian Goldman would study for a blood test. <laughs> I was really uh, kind of ashamed when I heard it, and now it kind of makes me laugh every time. It just makes me chuckle. It's just such a loving, there's such something so, so, uh, so wonderful about that. Um, so, so, you know, I, I, I'm driven to write the book, and I was driven to write the book, and and there are t I, I, I will tell you, I find it very difficult to be kind to myself. There's actually a great study that came out, I learned about several years after I finished training, that uh, they took a poll of healthcare providers and they rated them first. They asked them to self-rate um, their kindness towards others. And the majority of healthcare providers will rate that very high. And then they asked them to rate their kindness towards themselves. And it was very low. It turns out that you can't, and you actually say this in the book, you actually can't be kind towards others unless you are kind towards yourself. That's actually where it comes from. Yeah. So I'm, I, it made me very curious as you went out of your comfort zone how, uh, how that process was for you because it was not the book you intended to write. No, it wasn't, and and um, and and remember, I was starting from a very you know, as, as I developed this framing device, basically beginning with the first words of the book: "Am I a kind soul?" Like, and I, and I, you know, I'll tell you that I just have an intuition that I have an old soul. That's a very, in fact, in fact, you know, my my father died when he was ninety two, and and uh, you know, I was I was thirty five years his his junior, and uh, I would say that. You know, it was pretty clear to me that my soul is older than his. I'm, I'm quite sure of it. I, I was, you know, I was interpreting his dreams uh, near the end of the end of his life, almost not like a psychiatrist, like um, like, uh, well, more like a, more like a dream weaver. Like he had a he had a he had a dream of of seeing his mother. And uh, I, I'm, um, I, by the way, when it comes to this kind of thing, I'm I'm very metaphysical. I believe that in the in the eleven months from the time of of my um, uh, this is very dangerous um, <laughs> from the time of my father's death on October twentieth uh, of two thousand thirteen until my mother's death eleven months later that he was trying to tell me he was trying to talk to me and and he there were two or three um, and this this is the stuff by the way this is the stuff that didn't end up in the book but there there is a chapter about this he uh, that that um, that uh, we had a, a, a like my my thought like. The reason why this is such an important part of the mission of the book is that is that you know my my parents, you know they bickered, they argued. It was hard to know where their love and happiness was. Uh, sometimes it was in retrospect that, that that I could see it. And and you know my father never said he was not an I love you guy. He did acts of love. He looked after my mother for 15 years. It was the best job he ever had when she had dementia when she was diagnosed with dementia. And and um, in fact, his the journey of the towards the end of his life, um, um, you know, f he he did everything for her. He was her organizer, her social or convener, her bookkeeper, um, her uh, her uh, uh, occupational therapist, her physiotherapist, and eventually her personal care aide. And we were just getting designs together to build a ramp to the front door of the house because she could no longer walk. When, when she developed shingles on the side of her neck and couldn't swallow, and she became severely dehydrated, was admitted to hospital, and that was the, the only time that he yielded to the logic of the situation, that, that he could preside over her death at home or not, or, or have her in a long-term care facility. So he agreed, he hated it. 
they were married for 62 years. And, and, you know, I never saw them as, as soulmates. In fact, he, he, I remember the one time when I, when he talked about the exasperation, the despair that he felt, you know, as, as he tried to keep a working marriage together, you know, the appearance of a working marriage together, even as her dementia was getting more and more profound. Um, he once said, you know, once I asked him in my own exa exasperation, why, why do you, why are you doing this if you're complaining so much? And he said, because she's my wife and I love her. And it was the first time he'd used the word love in that context. I was almost embarrassed to hear it. It was like I was hearing an intimacy that wasn't mine to hear. So, so um, I had to, what I had to do, you can cut in any time you like. Well, I, I'm, so I, I said we both had to have growth mindsets because interviewing an interviewer is weird. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so, so you actually said something there that was so important. Why, why are you doing it? You're complaining, and there's this, there's this passage in the book that I wanted to to ask you about. Um, it's it's in the chapter at the bar at Ground Zero. Um, Brian's gone down to New York uh, to Ground Zero. He's talking to some bartenders, um, and uh, there's this line. I feel like that might be what where your dad was at. Um, this uh, this woman Heller, uh, she says. I don't want to sound rude, but empathy is something that is frightening to tap into. It means you have to take a good hard look at yourself and be aware of other people's pain and not just your own. And it's probably one of the best phrases or uh, descriptions of empathy that I've heard. And it, it resonated with me because I, I think that empathy is hard because you really have to enter into someone else's suffering. And at least as a healthcare provider and of course a community member, what's hard about that is that you actually have to you have to have two skills, not just the skill of leaning in, or even maybe not skill, but the, the willingness. But then you have to have some skill to take care of yourself. So as it pertains to your dad or maybe some other thing that you've seen in your job or in the book writing, where does that, the book is a lot about empathy, but where's the skill, where's the importance of the skill on dealing with the consequences of being empathetic? You have to, you know, to be empathetic. For, let's start with what, what do you have to do? How do you set the stage for being empathetic to others? Um, you have to be empathetic to yourself. Um, so you have to tune into yourself. You have to breathe. You have to center yourself. Um, you, the, the work of, of empathizing with others begins with unpacking your own stuff. Because if you don't unpack your own stuff, um, you will you will be a prisoner of of self preoccupation, and I think a lot of health professionals are. They don't know it. You know, there's a lot of concealed like uh, concealed rage behind behind a really toothy, uh, mirthless grin. You see a lot of that, a lot of sighing in 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 in, in hospitals, and and you know I, I you know I think that that that. That's You're painting us so, in a really bad light. Well, no, I'm not. No, I, no, I, I love. No, I love my <laughs> colleagues because, but because, but I want to help them get over the hump. And the hump is, is you know, the hang up about mistakes and the hang out, hang up about being caught out for being rude. Um, it, it better to to admit that that's where you're at instead of saying, oh no, I'm really a nice person. What what I just said wasn't rude. Um, or, but 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 you have, but to do that, you have to be able to tune into somebody else. And it's a big roadblock because if you are um, in in a kind of a shame prone mode, and I think a lot of health professionals are, I think they have a lot of undeclared shame, and and for most of them, they get through their careers and their lives um, living in terror that somebody's going to catch them making a mistake. It never hap you know, it, that it never happens because there's plenty of reasons why it never happens. You know, patients don't die every time there's a mistake. There's a lot of built-in redundancy. Someone else discovers it, or they're more resilient. Their bodies are more resilient, and 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 the the diagnosis you missed, somebody's able to make it the next day, and it's okay. But when something really bad happens, and and there's no escaping it, like taking off the wrong leg in the in the or the wrong taking out the wrong lung in in the operating room, or an obstetrical um, disaster, uh, or an emergency disaster, and for us, it's often sending a patient home, and then and then and then we hear the three words, you know, "Do you remember?" Which was the kind of the main part of my of my TED talk. Do you remember that patient you sent home the other day? 
Um, and, and, and that's when you are in the throes of toxic shame. And, and it's no accident that we've got lots of colleagues who are kind of hovering around burnout, uh, a tendency to be depressed. So where's the skill set in, in if, if you're going to lean in, whether it's to your own shame or to the, the, the suffering of someone else, where's the skill set on, on taking care of yourself after you do that? Having the, so the first thing is having the courage to give it voice, say, say what happened. Now, you have to say it to somebody, you have to find somebody you trust. Um, and, and as Brene Brown uh, would say, Dr. Brene Brown, the, the professor of social, of social work at the University of, of Houston, who um, has written some marvelous books about, about shame, that, that you know, you're looking for somebody and, 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 and there are now some studies that, that when uh, health professionals make medical errors, they're looking for um, somebody to say, you're okay, you're still okay. And even better, um, the two most empathetic things that a person can, can, can say to somebody else when they're telling a story like that, bearing their soul, are me too. Not the other me too, which is very, very important, but the me too, I've, I've, had, I've had one just like that. And and so the skill is the skill is first of all being able to to um, look at yourself um, and try to suspend the judge judgment because we're very judgmental in healthcare and 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 certainly Brene Brown and others would say that that the more judgmental our people are as a group the the more that they're shame based there's a lot of shame shame in that so that's part that's part of the toolkit and and you know doing a TED talk and talking about it, it was a very public way of talking about about one of my worst mistakes, which happened very early in my career, and and uh, and so that's important. And then, uh, then you know, one, but when you hear people suffering, when you when you lean in and you bear witness to someone else's suffering, and then you have a consequence of that, what do you do? Because if you don't do any, my experience is that when when you don't take care of yourself, you can't do that forever. And she says, and actually the later part of this of this quote, it's on page one hundred and eighteen. She says, I've learned, I've had to learn to build a wall so I don't get affected when a customer comes in with really sad news or something like that because there's only so much I can take. Mm -hmm. So so when you lean in and then there's only so much, what do you do with that? How do you how do you how do you navigate not building a wall? I think building a wall is I I'm I i do not know I don't think she actually builds a wall. I think she Me says either. she builds a wall. Me I think too. she's totally yeah. I don't think she builds a wall either. No. But there's a skill that she doesn't name, and, and I think you can't, I, I feel, the reason I, I'm pressing you on this question, because I feel like you can only learn and, and desire kindness and empathy to, to, to so much of a degree, because if you don't know how to manage it, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna have a problem. Okay, so, so fair, these, are, these are fair points. So one, one point is, is remembering that you that 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 even though we talk, I talk in the book about synchrony, the two minds coming together, the same parts of their brains light up, mom and baby, uh, two people who are clicking, probably a bartender and a customer in that in that kind of situation, and 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 those are the moments when not only do you click, but if they're asking for help, you're going to do more than serve them an extra drink or make sure they have a taxi home. You might actually take them home and start to help them with the problems that they're having, their marriage is falling apart. In the case of Heller, this was New York City in the wake of 9-11 of and having to, to talk uh, merchant bankers and commodities traders off the ledge because, because they had lost, they were, they were suffering from tremendous survivor guilt having, having not been at the World Trade Center that day. And these, by the way, these are the stories we don't hear about. Uh, the people who feel survivor guilt. Uh, you know, in the book I talk about the firefighters, the chauffeur, for instance. What an awful slang term. The chauffeur drives, drives the truck, drives the fire truck. And so this chauffeur was feeling guilty that he uh, had PTSD and, and feeling guilty that he had driven his colleagues, his comrades, to their deaths. And, and so, so um, I, I was talking about synchrony. Synchrony means putting your minds in sync. It doesn't mean you are the same person. So first rule is don't, just because you're identifying with somebody else doesn't mean you become that other person. And, and it is so important to be able to say, this is where 
Um, this is where I end and you begin. And there is a separation between us. And maybe it's my own background. You know, my, my sister and I made a pact. I had 15 years of hearing my dad despairing about my mom. And I would say to my sister, I'd say to Joanne, you know what? This is what we, this is what I think we should do. We should support him, but not drown in his sorrow. As long as the sweet spot between those two, and I know families that do this. It's like a shared drowning in sorrow. And, and it's, or anxiety or shame or whatever it is. And, and, and uh, so that, that's, that, that, that's one thing. The other thing is um, knowing enough about yourself to know what emotions in the other person kindle in you the same reaction. And for me, it's anxiety. If a patient's anxious, I'm anxious. And at some point, I have to deal with that anxiety. One way is withdrawing, sometimes medicating, sometimes explaining. There are healthy ways of dealing with it, but sometimes uh, handing the patient over to somebody else and saying this is too overwhelming. And so knowing enough about yourself to know when you can draw that line. That's great. I've taken a lot of um, his time. Do you guys have some questions? Hi there. Hi. I was wondering how this has changed your practice and if you are teaching this to any students or residents around you. Um, it is, it has changed, my, so first answer, it has changed my practice. Um, I am, um, you know, earlier, very early in my career, it was, it was all about the diagnosis and, 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 um, and even if it was an exotic diagnosis that, that had awful consequences for the patient, now I find myself silently praying that they don't have what, what I, I think it might be. Um, I, uh, and, and so, so the hunt for the diagnosis kind of has come and gone for me. I'm not as jazzed by that. I'm much more um, happiest, I'm at my happiest when I'm just being with patients and their families, and just, just kind of, just, just being with them. And, and I've, I'm, I'm less worried about showing a sense of humor. Um, you know, I, we passed through, a, like you can't, you know, as a CBC host, I can't have a sense of humor. It was actually lobotomized <laughs> several, uh, several years ago, that, that part of it. You're not allowed to because it's too risky. It's just too risky. And humor will offend people. But, so I've, I've learned how to not be, you know, to be situational rather than, so I, I, so what I do now is I turn my attention to them. I'm looking at eye contact. I'm, you know, I'm looking at facial expressions to see so that so that it, it, it each each encounter is an engagement is is an exercise in in, in can I, can we engage with each other can we get you know, closer to that same to that same page and what special skill what kind of insight um, I want when I when I when I leave we have very brief encounters one of the things I want to make sure of is that they they haven't felt inhibited about saying something that they thought might contribute to the diagnosis is there a one more thing or a three more things or a ten more things I'm here. I sit down. I don't stand over them on the stretcher. I sit down so that so that they can they can um, um, know at least feel for a moment that I've got all the time in the world to be with them. I think I heard you ask to um, whether you're trying to teach that. Are you teaching that through modeling it, or are you teaching it explicitly? Um, both, both modeling and explicitly, and and uh, and uh, and and it's great because I I, I can. I, you know, I've become a convert to the idea that kindness is is a, is a, is an infinitely renewable resource. And by the way, the other thing, the other thing, the most important thing, thing is to just show that I'm enjoying being in their presence. Now, they're suffering, but that you know, there's still room for cuff, comfort even when there's pain or fear of uncertainty of a of a potentially terrible diagnosis like cancer. There's still a sense of I'm here for you. Other questions? Hi there. Um, I really enjoyed hearing your idea, I think it was Shannon was talking about how um, empathy and the consequence to empathy. So I would challenge the idea that maybe empathy doesn't have a consequence, and how would you think about that? Um, maybe there's a different word we can use instead of it having a consequence that would lead people to more empathy, to be able to go there more often. Well. Actions have consequences, so there are, you know, and, and I, I think if it's a good word, it's a good word, let, let, let's use it. Uh, I think that, that 
um, one, of the, one of the things that's both troubling and comforting at the same time that I discovered when I spoke to, I thought his name was Christian Kaisers, it's Christian Kaiser, because his, because his mother was French-Belgian, and, uh, and, and that's, that's the way he preferred to have his, that's the way he prefers to have his name, his name spoken. Anyway, Christian said to me, he's studying mirror neurons, the vanilla form of empathy, the empathy circuitry that some people disagree that that's empathy, but, but uh, let's, let's, let's agree that there's a lot of interesting research there, that there's, there are actually brain cells that will, that will light up when you carry out an action and when you observe somebody else carrying out that action. So that's thought to be the seed of empathy, that the, why would you have the circuitry? Part of it is to, re, is to rehearse, but the other part of it is to put yourself in the place of the other person doing the action or tasting something awful or smelling something bad, whatever. Um, he also said something very important to me, and that is that, that we have this thing called frontal lobes that give us executive function, meaning we're constantly weighing options, outcomes, and empathy is a choice. So can you have too much empathy? Yeah. Can you, know, can you be too overwhelmed by empathy? Yeah, it's a choice. And, and uh, just as some people might have the circuitry to, you know, to be the predilection to be addicted to a substance, a behavior, um, could you be addicted to the pursuit of empathy? Probably. I think so, probably, and so and you have to have you have to have a balance. And empathy is constant; it's a constant choice between um, doing, you know, between my needs and your needs, my family's needs and your family's needs, you know, uh, and 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 so that's that that's one um, that's one thing I want to say. The other thing I want to say is that we also have this very primitive circuitry in our brain that separates the world into us and them. And you're seeing that in the United States right now. You're seeing it. It's being inflamed. You know, the amygdala is the seat of us and them. And us meaning, you know, in groups and out groups. In group, um, within a millisecond, if you see a face of somebody you recognize from an in group, you will ascribe to them kindness, empathy, industriousness, loyalty, all those good things. And if you perceive that the person is belonging to an out group, them, uh, you will you will say that they're lazy that they're not industrious that they're not empathetic that they're not charitable and 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 the the good news is that we you know executive function overrides that unless you're under stress from economic uncertainty um, you know precarious employment precarious food precarious shelter um, precarious security and, and so what we're hearing now, particularly in the United States, is, is, is this kind of revving up, whipping up of, of anxiety about barbarians at the gate. And, and, and no good will come from this. You know, there could be the, you know, the, there is a security imperative that governments have to be able to protect their citizens, but, but this, is, this is venturing into, into meanness, which is very different from, from any rational explanation for, for, for why they're doing what they're doing right now. It's a very scary time. I think I saw a question at the back. Okay, so this is a bit of a silly question, but um, I know some people who very much will want to know the answer. I haven't read your book, but my mother has, and uh, she told me about a section in which you talk about robotics and robots and how that relates to virtual empathy. And I sort of wanted to know if you did any looking into virtual pets and how that relates and evolves into those things and what you thought of that. Uh, so yes, I did. And, and you know, in the chapter, I had a conversation with a robot, but I also, I spoke to, uh, to some deep thinkers about, about, you know, what it all means uh, to, to have, um, to have robotic versions or Android versions of, of human beings. Um, uh, and there were some, there were some things that frankly gave me the creep factor. I'll get to VR in just a second. Um, that you know, for instance, it would be possible to create. There, there, uh, uh, um, Hir um, Hiroshi Ishiguro, um, who is the who is a a, a world famous roboticist, and he's developed. Um, uh, you know, at, at his lab, he has developed uh, a number of robots, but of a particular kind. One is called the Geminoid. Geminoid, you know, from Gemini, so it's, uh, this is a twin of him. And, and uh, some wealthy people have purchased, for a lot of money, um, uh, like CEOs of companies uh, for marketing purposes, uh, Geminoid versions of, of themselves. 
and uh, you know they've also had Geminoid like twin versions of of Galileo, and that's that's fun because now you have Galileo in in a museum, and children can ask Galileo the answers to contemporary questions about about uh, about but using Galileo's mind. I, you know, that's all wonderful. But I but Ishiguro like I, I asked Ishiguro, are, are there people you won't create? And he said, uh, you know, they won't create uh, Hitler. For instance, not until you know, not as long as people are living who were who were scarred by 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 the Holocaust, but he might later on when when they become when when Hitler passes into history as simply a, a historical figure, um, would he create a um, a Geminoid version of if somebody said my wife died, I want you to here's a photograph, create a Geminoid version, and they could do it. Um, but he said, eh, you know, I don't know if he's wisely he's he's a bit arch. He said uh, he said. Um, I could I could create this Geminoid version of of somebody's late spouse um, partner and but it would and 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 store all of their memories but it would still not be them because they wouldn't be able to access memories in think in in the same way that the uh, that their their late partner was able to do. Now the connection between that and and VR is quite simple. You don't need to create a robot. To create to create that that partner, that that person, that artificial being. Um, what you need for that is AI. Uh, you need to have a thinking That's artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence, deep, a deep learning system. What you need to have is a uh, is a um, um, yeah. And and by the way, and I and I had to learn about a lot of that stuff. And and so it really is deep learning for dummies, um, because and me is the is, uh, the first one on the list. Um, the the but you also study for a blood test so oh, but I also study for a blood test I, I I the roboticists the programmers I spoke to think that we're maybe 15 to 20 years away from a very compelling um, VR companion who would pass what they call the Turing test the Turing test by Alan Turing you know, the the idea that that this computer would simulate a human being so well that 30% of people would believe after about a five minute conversation with, with, with this, this computer generated being that you're talking to a human being. Um, and which, ha which happened to you in the book. Yes. You were talking to Erica. Yeah, I talked to Erica. Erica is beautiful, you know, um, girl, uh, a, young, a young woman in her 20s, and I cannot think of her, I cannot think of her as anything other than an android woman. Um, who kept calling me James. <laughs> and no matter how many times I tried to correct her, I was James. And I'll tell you that, that when Dave followed me and had exactly the same conversation, except she kept calling him Dave, I felt pangs of jealousy. <laughs> There's a message in that. And that is that the, it was, the, the, the reality of it was so compelling that- It was that, offensive. That I was in, that I was, that I saw Erica as a, a uh, as a person, and when that happens, that transcendent moment, when that happens, even if I'm a programmer, I don't want to take her apart and find out how she works. <laughs> and 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 roboticists will told me exactly that that once you once you begin to envision or see that 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 mechanical being as a as a as a real person, you don't want to take it apart, and it could be a pet, you don't want to take that apart either, and that is part of our human nature. You know, just as Tom Hanks, you remember in the film Castaway, when he had a relationship with Wilson, the, the volleyball? That's what we do. That's how we roll. And, and, and now, does that mean that, that there's a potential for that to be used to manipulate us? Absolutely. And I think there's going to have to be a lot of ethical uh, restrictions put on this, and uh, but but the technology will be there. You can count on it. So I'm mindful of our time. Um, I'm I'm mindful of the questions in the audience. I I didn't see another hand myself, but I'd like to make sure that if there is one, uh, more question. But I uh, I have one myself. So if you have a question, put your hand up and keep it up so I can see you. But otherwise, I'm interested in. Oh, good, excellent. Um, <coughs> I think the woman in the front. Do you want a mic? Can you raise your hand? You did. Sorry. Here, you can take mine for a minute. We, as regular people in life, we can use methods to maybe 
thwart the reaction of anger that's not beneficial to everyone, maybe by using a sound going, huh, or some trigger to allow that moment of anger to pass. The medical profession can't be going around doing things that might be a, a keto method or this method or that. How do you prevent it from actually doing harm to your own health when you can't be going around doing that? Um, in fact, we can. Um, and in fact, I remember in the mid 1980s um, taking a course in something called verbal judo. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And and it was the purpose of it was to fend off, was to fend off, um, you know, verbal abuse. And 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 uh, so so um, you'd be amazed at the way that the medical mind can sublimate uh, uh, rage. And 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 kind of deal with it in in ways. I mean, we, we do it to each other I, these days. The, I think the expression that that that's used is is uh, verbal aggression. You know that that you've experienced a verbal aggression, um, subtle put downs. Uh, um, it's 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 uh, it's and 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 the reason why I, you know I I think that and it brings me back to health professionals. Health professionals, we need we need to to you know right now. There's an acknowledgement that that more physicians than we thought have at least some of the symptoms of burnout. I don't think anybody's really sure whether this is a new phenomenon or just something that people are more comfortable talking about because burnout is seen as a mental health condition, and I don't think there's anything more stigmatizing to to a physician than than having than being labeled as having a mental health condition, and I think that's wrong. Um, but and that's part of it. Uh, that's that's part of what I, I think is is important that we need to address within the system um, the pressures that are that are making that are that are kind of um, taking away our room to to just be uh, time pressure stress um, heightened expectations complexity of 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 our increasing complexity of our of our patients who have now a dozen diagnoses and are on a pack load of medications and and. Um, you know, medical knowledge, you know, advancing so quickly that it's it's impossible to keep up with it all, and and through it all, this attitude in healthcare that says, oh yeah, I can take on one more thing, oh sure, one more thing, one more thing, one more thing, one more thing, uh, at, to, to no limit, you're not allowed to say I'm tapped out, you're not allowed to say that because you're going to get this kind of kind of weird look that says, oh you're, you know, oh you're a little weaker than than the rest of us. It also turns out that when you go and try and study this kind of stuff, uh, which I, I have done in a different way than you, um, and you come back and you tell your colleagues what you've learned, they put their arm around your shoulder and they say, "Ah, it sounds like you learned how to hug better. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's a very interesting culture. Josh, where we're, are we at? We're good on time, so if you, if you guys feel okay. comfortable taking more questions, we're, we're great. Okay. There's a bunch over, I feel sensitive to this side of the Yeah, room. this side has been kind of ignored. But we know that you're the first person back on the we'll other side. We'll catch you. <laughs> I'm wondering if part of the issue in healthcare too is that as physicians, you're if you're doing a great job, you're dishing out lots of empathy all the time, but you're never receiving empathy. And and what's the effect of that? How do you how do you sustain a high degree of empathy when you're never a recipient yourselves, or are you a recipient? And how do you gain that empathy from somebody else so that's that's a that's a uh, thank you thank you for the question the I think that that um, it, it cannot be you can it, by definition you cannot be all given and no and no receive it's impossible so you're right I think your intuition is that maybe you are getting it from some someplace else um, but to do that you have to you have to know yourself. You have to forgive yourself for your mistakes. You have to allow yourself to be human. You have to know yourself enough to know your limits, and 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 be able to take care of yourself. Or and and that includes asking for help, um, being surrounded by loving you know loving partner like Tamara is my is my partner having kids, uh, who I adore and and you know I've gotten back to running. Uh, you know I was for about 22 months. I was doing the morning prayers, the cottage prayers, the ones that were. On the Pittsburgh uh, newspaper, Pittsburgh was it Gazette? The, the they had they had Yitka Dalvi Yitka Dashime Rabat. That was that was on the front page in response to last week's uh, uh, murder murdering spree in the synagogue, which which I thought was a wonderfully empathic 
gesture because it basically said we're all we're all suffering today. Um, and and but you you have to be, you have to do that. Now I have met people who are. This is where the shame comes back. I think a lot of people go into healthcare because they don't feel really good about themselves. Not everybody, but and, and so they're hoping that that healthcare is a is is a, a job that a profession that by definition you're doing lots of great things for people all the time. And that if they do enough of those, that that people will cut them a bit of slack if they for that inevitable mistake that they make, or they or they redouble. They say, "I'm going to be perfect." And I went through that stage of of thinking, "I'm pristine," until my first mistake, and then I would oh, I, you know, and I would try to make myself pristine again and error free again. And and and, and it occurred to me that that I, that if I kept going through that process, I had I was I was at a crossroads, right? I had to find a different way, and and that different way is. Because the danger, the danger of of, of the shame-based approach is that you you live in terror of being discovered, of having your mistake discovered. Well, if you if you're in terror of having your mistake discovered, then you you'll never discover your mistakes, and if you don't discover them, you'll never learn from them, and the system will never get safer. So there really is an imperative in breaking through that shame because it'll be good for everybody. Um, I know and I know that that if you've never gone through, if you've never gone through the experience of admitting that that, I really totally screwed up there and letting and letting it wash and letting the people you harmed apologize to them you're apologizing to them and letting them react to that if you haven't allowed yourself to feel that then it's still a mountain before you but once you get to the other side first of all you're going to discover that there's a lot of love and forgiveness um, I have almost never met a patient or a family member who when harmed and told this is what happened that that they haven't they haven't relaxed and and you haven't become friends afterwards you know, sometimes, I mean, there are some that, that that are hard to forgive, but 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 they just want to know the truth. <laughs> Most of the time, that's they just want to know the truth fundamentally. So 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 uh, so you got to deal with your stuff. If you're just giving and giving and giving and and not giving to yourself, eventually you're going to reach a point where you're just going to, I don't know, want to harm yourself or be really depressed or really burnt out or something. Yeah. There's so many questions. This is fabulous. Um, there's one in the back, and then I see one in the middle here. Do you think that we're hardwired to be kind and empathetic? Do you think people are born um, em with empathy and, and kindness in their heart, and somehow the world just takes it away and plays havoc with us? Yes. We are hardwired to be kind and, and empathic, um, otherwise you know, it's it, it's it's you know by evolution, you know by natural selection, whatever. Um, the the we wouldn't build a society. Um, parents wouldn't look after their young. Um, they wouldn't become attached to them uh, without without the hard wiring. Um, but stuff gets in the way, and what gets in the way is are other things we've talked about: stress, uh, time pressure, anxiety, um, all the things that that take us to our more primitive selves and that tendency to do the us and, and them you, thing. You say in the book too there's a section about um, about this very question in case you in case you have not got through the whole thing. Um, it's actually addressed in the later part of the book and uh, 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 where there's an empathy program um, about learning it um, and, and the idea being that it's not uh, that if we're all born with it but that we may not have been modeled it in our homes yeah. um, and in the people that are closest to us, but there is an ability, if that hasn't happened, um, to potentially see it um, and, and, and take it after it when, when, when it's seen later. And so that was a beautiful education program that they that's spoken about in one of the last chapters of the book. Roots of empathy, yeah, and and it's interesting because Mary Gordon said uh, nobody's asked the question, can you teach empathy to others, and you can't. It, but the good news is you're hardwired for it, unless you are, you know, a, a psychopath, a narcissist, or a uh, or a Machiavellian. And <laughs> don't uh, get into that. <laughs> um, well, no, we, we, you can have a smattering of these traits, but 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 uh, unless you meet the the the, the criteria. Uh, the diagnostic and statistical manual criteria for, for, for those it's as personality also in the book. disorders. <laughs> it's also in the book. It's also in the book. <laughs> there is a question in the middle here. Yes, this hand, uh, Josh. Uh, Thank you. 
I would like to go back to the empathy uh, idea for a minute. I'm sorry, I hope you can hear me. I can. Uh, I'm listening to your discourse and it's wonderful. But every time you say empathy, what I'm hearing actually is compassion. And I see it as a higher degree of, um, so you, you gave an example and you said you sit with your patient in front of you, just diagnosed with, with cancer. Um, and you can sit with a pain and you can say, I'm right there for you. What I hear, it's a lot of compassion. Sympathy, it's quite interesting because psychopaths can actually learn social skills where they usually do, and they can learn empathy. What is your take in compassion? What do you, th what's your idea of compassion? So that's a, that's a, that's that, thank you. That's interesting. Um, Paul Bloom uh, wrote, wrote the book Against Empathy, uh, and I was, I was living in terror that people would kind of kick my book to the curb. One of the, by the way, one of the reasons why we called it Kindness is that there's so many books with the word empathy like as in the title, although this one has it in the subtitle, that I, I just thought I, I wanted to distinguish it. And then after a while, I came to the, to the idea that, 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 you know, so what is kindness? Um, let's start with that. Kindness, is, so first of all, for, for the, 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 just a quick uh, primer on the, on the uh, quick glossary, um, empathy that we're talking about is, is using your imagination, intuition, whatever, to, to put yourself in the place of somebody else and have it inform your actions. Not, not govern your actions because, because it's a choice and, and you, you cannot over, you shouldn't over identify with somebody else. But, but does it, would it hurt a hospital executive to know, for instance, what it's, what it's like to be on a gurney for five days in a hallway? I, no, I, you know, you know, would it, would it, would it necessarily lead to them having to end the problem of hallway medicine in their institution? I don't know, um, but it, but it, it can't be an irrelevant detail. And and maybe it's that better that they're in that hallway than than not being admitted to hospital at all. And, you know, so that's the informing part of it. So that's cognitive empathy, sympathy. I've I've, I've seen definitions that extend from being at one, being in the same emotional state as, as, as the other person, to, to in fact, uh, a detached gesture of concern that really involves no uh, empathic investment. Like, I have no idea what this person who's just lost all, all the members of their family in a horrific uh, bus crash is feeling, and I don't know what to say at a moment like that. So we say things like, sorry for your loss. And, and what I'm describing is a totally anti-empathic position because, because you don't want to feel what the other person's feeling and you're almost saying, I'm not going there at all. And, you're, and, and, you're, and when you see them, you feel the sense of awkwardness that I don't know what to say at a time like this because I'm afraid I'm going to put my foot in my mouth. So what are you demonstrating there? You're demonstrating that you're self-preoccupied, not you. One is self-preoccupied. And in that state, it's very hard to, to be empathic with other people when you're self-preoccupied, which is one of the major lessons in, in the book. Um, so Paul Bloom in his book said that empathy is probably not helpful because it, he thinks it leads to over-identification with somebody else and it leads to helping some people and not others. And, and he made a plea for something that he called rational compassion. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think it's a partly semantic um, discussion. Um, I think that kindness, I know, and there are etymologists in, in the room that are saying, no, Brian, words matter. <laughs> words matter. Um, my view of kindness is, is reaching a state of synchrony with somebody else where your intuition is that exquisite, where you, or you've asked enough questions, you've delved deeply into this person that you give them an, an act of kindness, which is more than a whole, it, it, it's something that they didn't even know they needed at that moment. And sometimes you get a look of astonishment, like how could you have possibly known that that was exactly what I needed right now? Like the helping hand that, and, and I've done that recently where I, you know, I, I, I've said to myself, you don't know this, but this is your lucky day. This is what you need, and I, and I may be wrong, by the way, I may be wrong, if you've ever held a door open for somebody and gotten a scowl from them, like, what makes you think I need a door held open for me? That if it's a gesture for you and not for them, that's not kindness. Okay, so I, we're, we're all around the, 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 the semantics, the semantics of it, but that's what I think we're talking about. And it is one-to-one, -one, it's person-to-person. 
uh, and, and, and you have to forge a connection with that person to be able to extend that gesture. Great answer. And she's lucky because she's in the front row, so I can just hand my mic to her. Thank you. And at the risk of backtracking slightly, I was really um, taken by your comment about the um, why people go into medicine, the, uh, the sort of negativity around that in some, some personality characteristics. And what struck me is, first of all, that surprised me, but I, I accept your, um, your description. However, I'm wondering, do you think there's a difference in the motivation between genders for going into medicine? Because I suspect there would be. If that's your description, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, it's, it's, it, thank you. It's, it's a complicated question. Uh, from the standpoint of empathy, we know from the Jefferson scale of physician empathy that, that it, it hasn't reached statistical significance, but, but women are somewhat more uh, empathic than men. I mean, I think it's, with the studies, uh, many studies have, have shown that, that the centers of the brain that are the empathic centers of the brain, you know, light up more brightly for, are more active in, in women. There are more connections. I'm having empathy for you now, trying to answer this question with a female physician. <laughs> yeah. Um, do, I, I, and, and for me, I, and but, but, if I, if, well, I, I'm about to defer. Um, I'm not going to speak for women as to why they went into medicine. I can't. Um, I can't. So who are you speaking for? I'm, I'm speaking in, in, in generalizations about empathy. But not about, but not about motivation for going into medicine. Shannon, take it away. Oh, nice. <laughs> Classic. So this is when you get into trouble with interviewing an interviewer. <laughs> I'm actually just going to go to the next question. <laughs> but you know, but you know what? I can give you a very practical answer, because because um, I think I think a lot of I think a lot of men. Um, I can speak. For, I can speak more for men than for women. Have have decided for one reason or another that there that there's something about medicine that it's that it, it, it has become somewhat tarnished in the uh, in 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 the public's esteem. Maybe there's more government control than there used to be. There's less opportunity to make more money, and 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 so it's become a a, a less prestigious job, and they and they've moved on to something else. Um, I suspect that more women are applying, and I suspect that more women are succeeding because they're working harder and they're succeeding more. Um, so, so it's complicated, and I don't think, so I, 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 think, I don't think it has as much to do with the kindness uh, part of it that, that you want to know the, the answer to. I think what you really want to know, what I want to know is, will medicine, will healthcare be kinder in the next few years because of that? And, and I say wait and see, because I've seen examples on both sides. I've seen, you know, I, I've, I've spoken to women who, who have modeled themselves after, after, after male uh, mentors, and, and you know, in some cases they pick up some of the habits of their male mentors, and some of them aren't, aren't that great. On the other hand, as they break that glass ceiling, um, I, I have every reason to believe that they will find a different way of operating. For one thing, they they're much more comfortable than men in dealing in teams, and to have teams, what is, you know, what's the essence of working in a true team? And that is having empathy for all the players on the team, and not and not being hierarchical about those. So I I have my suspicions, I have my hopes. It will be interesting. It will be fascinating. There is there is an article that came out not that long ago um, indicating that women uh, who may be higher on the empathy. Uh, compared to male counterparts, but also who uh, struggle with the consequences, going back to a question earlier of that. And so whether there are more women in the uh, healthcare provider workforce, but with whom, and this is why I asked the question about skill um, and needing some skill, um, Anyway, there's there's huge parts of the book that this that this conversation draws on, including this habituation that you talked about with an fMRI, seeing a so a functional MRI and and the part of the brain that lights up when you see uh, you're shown pictures of people's faces in pain, and healthcare providers who have been in practice for increasing lengths of time, their brain lights up less when they see 
when they see when they see someone else in pain and the idea that it might be a bit of a habituation as an adaptive process and and what we do about that but I don't I I don't I was as surprised as you were by that comment that maybe we go maybe healthcare providers go into the field because they they uh, they need to know that they're okay I was very curious about that too there's a question um, actually the second row Josh um, first Okay, so uh, male or female, I think there's an intrinsic uh, dilemma that all medical people are in and that applies also to all kinds of technical jobs um, where, except in, in the case of medicine, you're actually dealing with physical people in your, in your responsibilities, but however, there's a limit to empathy. Why? Because you're basically there to have all that data, to be able to bring it up, to be objective, to make the judgments, and that is a different part of the brain working. And you have, as you've said, you have to know when to you know, go from one to the other. But ultimately, I, I would say that you, the medical profession seems to be um, in a particularly fine point of this, this is skill requirement because you also are really on the on the line for errors and things like that. Would you agree that that discussion of empathy is fairly focused on mm. medical issues? Yes, I think you're part. I think you're partly right. By the way, um, I think that that the, the the distinction you know of people versus you know machines or computers, for instance, um, uh, there are very few people. Uh, in the service industries who don't work with people. You, know, it, you don't, it doesn't have to be medicine, it could be customer service, you know, it can be the front door to the Apple store, it can be the car dealership, you know, the person who's the service, rep the service representative that you talk to when your cadidola has suddenly busted on the highway and, uh, and your day is ruined. And, 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 and so the, I think the only difference, not the only difference, but one of the most salient differences is that in medicine, we have the privilege of seeing people at their worst emotionally, in the most, the most painful crises. And, and I'm reminded that, you know, you know I, I think there's something called compassion fatigue, the idea that, that the notion that, 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 you know, for this family, this is the first time they're being told this awful news, and for you, it's the thousandth time you've had that conversation. And for some, sometimes for, if, if we don't find a way of either replenishing that, that, that ability to be there, that there's a natural, with the patient or with the family, that there's a natural inclination to want to withdraw as a protective mechanism. That's considered a risk factor for burnout, compassion fatigue. And, and, so, and so there are differences between what, what we do in medicine, um, what Shannon and I do, and, what, and, and, and what's provided in other services. I don't know, you know, what's the worst that happens when your car can't be resuscitated? Your car can't be resuscitated. You know, you can lease a new car, you can rent one, you know, you know, for some people it may be, you know, without that car I will never be able to, to, to go from here to there, I'm going to lose my job. I mean, there, there could be a cascade of terrible reversals because of that. And, and we, need compassion, uh, we need compassion for all those, there's, there's your word. That's great. Well, I think um, in uh, bringing us to a close, I'm, I'm thinking about sort of this loop uh, we've, of conversation we've been on, and one of the things we haven't touched on um, is your last chapter, or one of the last chapters, when you go and study um, dementia. And uh, I, I'm thinking of you um, as a writer and the process of all of this for you and, and, and kindness towards you, both in this moment as you write this book, because your mom had dementia. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and I'm curious whether in writing and in, in researching that chapter, you had any of the knowledge of what's called the validation theory. Um, if you had any of that knowledge while your mom was alive, and whether you or your dad were able to do that, and I, I recognize this is maybe a personal question, okay. um, but I because part of the book um, that uh, that was written was actually cut, um, which was about your parents, and I. I, I, uh, I'm so excited to give this book and this, this particular chapter to, to my father-in-law, whose, whose mom has dementia, who, and he's really, really struggled. And the, book, the chapter was unbelievable. Um, and I, you. I'm hopeful um, for you that it, you got it, that you got that knowledge while your mom was alive, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little wistful there. Um, I did have it in time for my, for my father-in-law. Who had who had dementia and uh, 
Um, I, you know, I, but, but it was my experience with my mom that, first of all, had informed my experience with my father-in-law uh, in that, in that, um, you know, I, you, you have to kind of live with or be with somebody, have had many deep encounters with somebody um, to, to, to have had a, very, a pretty, I won't say a complete picture, but a, but a substantial picture or a picture of, of substantial depth a relationship with this person before they had dementia and then after, and um, and and uh, you know I think I think that that a lot of us um, faced with somebody who we love, somebody who we've had lots of good times with, who, who has dementia. If we see them infrequently, and then we notice, you know, and the penny drops, and we kind of have that that awful moment that they can't recollect things that that you have in common. That that the the first inclination that a lot of us have is to be embarrassed by their by what they can't remember even even a, a little bit ashamed like I remember my dad uh, uh, saying you know if only uh, my mom had try, tried harder to, to remember stuff um, and 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 you know I think he was just kind of puzzled and, and, and disturbed by the whole process but but what I learned to do through my mother it was like sometimes you have to make the mistake once to to not make it a second time. With my father-in-law, I was able to appreciate, I always went in to see him saying, I'm just glad to be with you. You're still here. And, and so and what you do instead is to be their memory. You know, remember that time when we did this, or we did this and we did that, and just say it calmly and evenly, but just, but, but, and, and, and what I, what I didn't know that I was, like, well, you know, in that time I knew about validation, what I was doing with, with, with him as I walked into the room was centering myself. And people with dementia have an uncanny ability, you know, when they, they're in that disoriented phase when they have a tendency to be more agitated, to get antsy around people who are nervous. And so, and so if you've ever had an encounter with a loved one or somebody, you know, who you know well, who you visit from time to time, and it didn't go well, just search yourself. If you had been anxious, you know, maybe you were more disturbed, and they picked up on that, on that disturbance. And so if you can center yourself by breathing, and, and, and we talk about it, you know, we talk about it in the book, and including a young woman who, who, faced, a, who faced a gunman in, a, in, a, uh, in a, an all-night uh, store. Station. By 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 you and used validation on him to talk him down, and he left without without firing a shot. Um, so so that that's useful. Now um, to get personal with my mom, um, the I, I had started I had started to tell to tell the story that 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 didn't end up in the book that my that that my father died 11 months before before my mom, and um, and um, he. You know, it was in his in his kind of meal of sadness and anger. It was very hard to just to just you know he he was almost never relaxed in the time from the time my mom was in the nursing home until until he died. Um, it was rare to have him enjoy any any time because his marriage was to him was over. It, it was not a it was not a working marriage. You know, he fed her twice a day in the nursing home until one day he had a syncopal episode. He actually uh, he parked his car at home and had just turned off the motor, um, opened up the car door in the middle of the summertime and just collapsed. And he had a potassium level of 12, which is a, a potentially lethal level, and his heart nearly stopped. And from that point on, he couldn't drive, so he, he couldn't get to the, to the long-term care facility as often. It was, it was, it was, it was a bad situation. Um, what I had trouble empathizing with, with him, and I, and, and I now know that in retrospect, the whole search for empathy was to empathize with my parents. That what would be the worst thing for him? I know six days before he died, I took him to see my mom, or you know, his, his partner of 62 years. And ordinarily, he was the only one who could get a reaction out of her long after she had stopped reacting to any of us, except that day. And he had a stony look on his face, and he died six days later. It was like, that's it, I'm done. He died, and, and my sister and I we had, you know, we had Shiva, the, the seven days. When we went up from Shiva, we went to visit her, to symbolically tell her, except we didn't tell her because she had dementia, right? So I wasn't empathizing with her, and I certainly wasn't empathizing with my dad. I'll tell you, that three or four things happened, but, but very quickly. Um, the day we went up from Shiva, 
There was a ceramic sign on the door that said Shalom, and it had been there, standing there, like hung up on a nail for 17 years that we've been living in the house. Went to work, came back from work, it had fallen and broken. And in retrospect, you know, that sign that said Shalom was, was him. I believe it was him saying, tell your mother. Because I had to, re I had to realize it had to occur to me. But, but I knew it was always there, for, except for me to empathize with him. The worst thing for him in his life would have been to leave and have nobody notice, especially his partner. So that was that. Um, about a day before my birthday, uh, I was in the synagogue saying Kaddish, and I had a vision of him. And, and uh, for about 30 seconds, I didn't ask for it, didn't want it. Um, then uh, two days, a day later, I had my birthday, and I thought, oh, birthday present. But what was wrong with that was, that why wouldn't my sister get a vision like that? She was going to synagogue too. So, so and like, you know, what's a birthday? Happy birthday to you? No. A birthday is a spiritual connection between a mother and a child, and it represents the union of mother, child, and, and, and dad. Tell your mother. And I didn't. And then, fast forward to the day she was on her deathbed, and she was fighting to stay awake. Like, we were starting to dial up the hydromorphone, and, and she was aspirating. It was just an awful situation. We we're going to give her morphine. She's going to stop breathing. And, uh, you know, she wouldn't die. She was just grasping, was holding, like holding on for dear life. And the nurse, a lovely nurse, very empathic nurse named Kim, um, said, is she waiting for someone? And uh, three or four of us, my sister, I was there, Tamara was there. And she said, so when did you tell her? And I said, we didn't. And she said, you should tell her. You should. And so I did. I walked up to, to, to my mother. And you know, for a few years, I'd been calling her Shirley. Why? Because the caregivers called her Shirley. And I thought, maybe she'd forgotten she was a mother. <laughs> Validation. Maybe she, yeah. Um, and I, that was the, you know, I called her. I said, no, mom, uh, if you're hanging, you know, I, we've told you, Joanna and I have told you that, that, that we're OK. You can let go. But if you're waiting for dad, and I told her. And I was, uh, you know, I, it was very overwhelming. I, I, I started to tell her we didn't think you could handle it. And then I said, no, I didn't think I could handle it. I didn't want to, it was, it, you know, it was, I, I was afraid she was going to die right there and we'd have two fun funerals in a week and a half, which what some people have. Anyway, I started to leave the room and the nurse, Kim, in that wonderfully curious voice that nurses have, um, said, mm, something just happened. I turned around. My sister and Tamara were gasping because because my mother was sitting up there with a red face, processing it. There was a look of presence that we hadn't seen for years. And I came up to mom and I said, mom, did you understand what I said? She couldn't speak at this point. I said, I, you know, I, I you used to say, mm-hmm, can you say it? And she grunted, mm. And I said, really? And she grunted again. And I'm quite sure that my dad had blown a kiss in, in, into the room. He said, I, I'm, I'm sure he said, you got 10 minutes, make him count. And for the next 10 minutes, we just caught her up in the family. And she was there, present, until it was gone. And, and then she died, and she died about eight hours later. And, uh, you know, um, it was, a, it was a, an uplifting thing. You know, I don't feel it in the same sense of, of ecstasy. There was ecstasy in the room that day. And, and for me, though, the, the challenge was to empathize with her, what she needed, because if you think about it, if you believe in any kind of spiritual destiny, for her to leave this world believing she hadn't said goodbye to her husband, wondering where he was was a terrible thing. For him, his soul would have been in turmoil because his wife is passing into the next world not knowing that he's predeceased her. It's a really beautiful thing talking to you. Mm -hmm. Beautiful I, talking like, to it's, you too. It's really just been a beautiful time to to yeah. go on like this full loop of kindness in the world, kindness in medicine, kindness in your family, kindness in your heart. Thank you for talking with us, Brian. Thank you.